thanks thanks everyone uh I'm very sad that i can't be there in person uh but i just like to thank the canes fund for their generous support of this project um and for the organizers uh, for putting the day together so the paper i'll be presenting is called the us as a safe haven evidence from convenience yields exchange rates and country risk in the short and long run uh it's co-authored with giancarlo corsetti simon lloyd and emile marin and i should point out that the you I'm going to discuss today are, are not those of the Bank of England. Okay, so to begin, um, how do we know that the U.S. is a safe haven? So the situation today uh, in global financial markets actually makes for a good case study of this. So as you guys are probably uh, all aware, the U.S. dollar has gained considerable strength in the past months and days uh, relative to the euro, the yen, and the pound, which are three currencies that are or were once considered global reserve currencies. So why is this happening? Well, it arguably reflects uh, sort of the, the Federal Reserve's hiking of interest rates and the pace at which they're hiking, as well as investors' perceptions about the future space that the Fed has to hike rates. Uh, and obviously, this is related uh, to the relative resilience of the U.S. economy during this period of uncertainty uh, and global stress. So Hopefully, uh, well, so, so more generally, uh, uh, and hopefully that example made it a little bit clear, exchange rates act as a barometer of relative risk between countries. In particular, safe countries' currencies should appreciate against risky countries. So uh, risky countries' currencies. So why is this happening? Well, safe countries have less of a precautionary savings motive, which bids up their interest rates. And with the standard pharma logic, high interest rate currencies tend to appreciate. Now, more recently, uh, a lot has been made of uh, deviations from covered interest parity, which is a risk-free cross-border no arbitrage condition. And these deviations from covered interest parity have been known to capture the relative convenience, liquidity, and safety of holding bonds denominated in US dollars as compared to bonds denominated in other currencies. So this is another example uh, of US safety. In particular, uh, the convenience yield, this CIP deviation, uh, on short maturity U.S. bonds tends to be positive and spikes during periods of global stress. So uh, that implies that investors particularly desire the convenience, liquidity, and safety of holding assets denominated in dollars during these stressful times. So in this paper, uh, we seek to answer, um, you know, against this backdrop, is there, are there any cracks materializing uh, uh, in the dollar standing as the safe haven? Uh, and in particular, is the dollar losing its relative shine? Uh, and to do this, we're going to turn to the long run. So if you were to look at just the exchange rate market, foreign exchange market, you would think that you, you would, the answer would tend to be no, the dollar is not losing its relative shine. Specifically, long run pecuniary returns to holding US dollars are, are very little changed uh, uh, over time. So we see this here, this plots the, the long run exchange rate risk premium for the dollar. Uh, and highlights that you know the line is relatively flat. There hasn't been much change in this pecuniary return to holding dollars. So this is an average sort of carry trade that goes long uh, 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 foreign currencies, which are an average of G7 uh, relative to the dollar. So that so so that pecuniary return is little changed over the past 20 years. However, if you turn to markets, you're going to find that the non-pecuniary return to holding long maturity U.S. bonds, sort of a long maturity convenience yield, has fallen considerably over time. So we plot that here uh, in this figure, uh, and this is uh, this this has been like a real puzzle in international finance in recent years because it essentially implies that investors prefer to hold bonds denominated in foreign currency rather than U.S. dollars at long maturity. So they value the convenience, liquidity, and safety of holding say Australian bonds as compared to US dollars, US dollar bonds. So, so what's going on here uh, is gonna be essentially the name of this paper. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring into the picture what we call relative country risk. And we're gonna measure this relative country risk using equity markets. I'm gonna make this connection clear uh, in a few, few slides. But what we're gonna show is that the US equity risk premium has risen considerably over time. And I plot this here relative to uh, uh, the average of G7 currencies. And in particular, this rise in US risk is driven entirely by a rise in its long run or permanent risk, which we measure as the equity risk premium net of the term premium 
Uh, and I'm going to discuss the logic for that uh, in a few slides. So here you see a large increase in our proxy for U.S. long run risk uh, over our sample period. OK, so um, in sort of search to, in, in our effort to answer this question, you know, is the U.S. Uh, losing? it's standing as the safe haven, we're going to ask two slightly more specific questions. So those are uh, into which assets and at what maturities is U.S. safety priced? We're going to develop, we're going to develop a theory, which is going to be a two country, no arbitrage model, where we're going to make no assumptions about the preferences of investors in order to jointly assess U.S. safety in three internationally interconnected markets, exchange rates, bond markets, and equity markets. And our theory is going to output uh, an equation that looks like this, which is going to state that uh, there's a tight link between uh, U.S. relative risk, uh, the U.S. exchange rate risk premium, and the convenience yield uh, on U.S. dollar assets. So in particular, in equilibrium, changes in U.S. relative risk should be met either by movements uh, in the pecuniary return to holding U.S. dollar assets or the non-pecuniary return to holding U.S. dollar assets. And as I mentioned before, since we measure this relative risk using equities, uh, this equation is going to allow us to sort of answer that first question. So into which assets is U.S. safety priced? Is it equities? Is it foreign exchange? Or, or is it bonds? And next, we're going to decompose uh, this equation into a permanent component and the transitory component. And this is going to allow us to, to this is going to allow essentially um, shocks to permanent and transitory risk to elicit distinct responses uh, from pecuniary or non-pecuniary returns. And this is going to allow us essentially to answer at what maturities is U.S. safety priced. Uh, and when we take these equations to the data, our main result is going to be that the rise in U.S. relative risk, in permanent risk, and the fall in long maturity convenience yields, uh, which I showed you earlier, are, are, are two sides of the same coin. Okay, so I'm going to briefly outline the theory uh, there's going to be two countries, uh, the U.S. and uh, a foreign country. Uh, each country is going to be populated by a representative investor with pricing kernels Lambda uh, and Lambda Star. And following Albers and German, we're going to decompose these pricing kernels into a permanent component, which is a martingale, and the transitory component, uh, uh, which is sort of the residual. Now, this permanent component is going to be used for pricing permanent risk, which is risk that cannot be intertemporally smooth. So you can think of this as sort of the steady state or equilibrium probability uh, uh, of a disaster or a financial crisis. So you can think uh, if risk rises, um, if, if risk rises in all periods, there's no way to intertemporally smooth that risk, for example, with a bond. Conversely, transitory risk is going to be able to be intertemporally smooth. So you can think of business cycle risk. So if risk rises tomorrow relative to today, you can use a bond to, to, to smooth that risk. Then we're going to create uh, uh, these stochastic discount factors, which are just the ratios uh, of these pricing kernels. Um, and these two will have a permanent and a transitory component. And finally, uh, our measure of relative risk is going to be the conditional volatility uh, of the stochastic discount factor, which we denote by this L term here. And that's just going to be the difference between the expectation of the log of the SDF and the log of the expectation. Uh, this is sometimes termed Jensen's gap. Uh, and when M is log normally distributed, this is just going to be one half of the variance of the SDF. So it might be useful to think uh, down the line that our measure of risk is essentially the volatility of investors' stochastic discount factors. Okay, so how can we think uh, about risk and uh, this risk and permanent and transitory risk? And uh, how can we actually measure it in the data? So first, Equities, we're going to turn to equity. So equities are a claim to the overall economy, the overall output of the economy. And as a result, they're going to contain both transitory and permanent risk. So all risk. As a result, Albers and German show there's a tight link between the volatility of the SDF, a country's risk, and the equity risk premium. And particularly, in particular, this volatility of the SDF is bounded from below uh, uh, by the equity risk premium. Next, bonds. Bonds can be used to smooth transitory risk. As a result, Albert and German are able to show a tight link between the permanent component of risk, of a country's risk, 
and the difference between its equity risk premium, which captures both transitory and permanent risk, and the, in, the, the term premium on an infinite maturity bond, which captures the totality of risk that can be smoothed uh, uh, using bonds, so all of transitory risk. So permanent risk uh, uh, is related to the equity premium net of the term premium. That was our measure uh, of permanent risk that I plotted uh, a few slides earlier. And uh, these two bounds are going to be crucial when we take uh, our theory to the data. Okay, now we're going to look to price assets uh, using these SDFs. Uh, first, um, without loss of general generality, we're going to assume that investors only value the pecuniary return on their own country's government bonds, uh, which are denoted by this RTK here. However, they are going to derive both a pecuniary return, which now includes the movement in the exchange rate, as well as a non-pecuniary convenience yield from holding bonds denominated in the foreign currency. Now, one can show that an equilibrium process for the exchange rate that satisfies these Euler equations states that the uh, relative uh, SDFs should equal the movement in the exchange rate, accounting for movements in the in the convenience yield. So this seems a little bit esoteric, but um, basically these Euler equations and exchange rate processes imply a tight link between pecuniary returns, non-pecuniary returns, and country risk, which are evident by this proposition here, which is exactly the equation that I showed you in words uh, at the start, basically states that U.S. relative risk is related to the pecuniary return on U.S. dollar assets uh, and the non-pecuniary convenience yield from holding, holding U.S. dollar assets. So in particular, a rise in U.S. relative risk can elicit or can sort of transmit through global financial markets through two channels uh, based on our model. The first is by influencing exchange rate risk premia. So higher U.S. relative risk uh, uh, sort of increases precautionary savings, lowering U.S. interest rates, which implies uh, an increase uh, in the pecuniary return to holding dollar assets. Uh, that is a depreciation of the U.S. dollar. But there's also a channel that might uh, uh, that might transmit via the convenience yield. So if this increase in the pecuniary return is not too large, then an increase in U.S. relative risk is going to lead to a fall in the convenience yield that investors derive from holding U.S. dollar assets. Uh, this implies that investors are no longer willing to forego pecuniary as much pecuniary return to hold uh, dollar-denominated assets. Next, we sort of decompose that uh, total risk equation into a permanent component and a transitory component. The permanent component uh, I outlined in this proposition here, and it states that uh, U.S. relative permanent risk is related to the long-run pecuniary returns to holding dollar assets, that is the long-run deviation from uncovered interest parity, as well as the long-run convenience yield to holding dollar assets. Now, it is well known that uh, uh, at long horizons, UIP tends to hold, or definitely holds significantly better than at short horizons. So in response to a rise in US permanent risk, if these movements in long run UIP are relatively contained, then one should expect to see a relatively large fall in the convenience yield on these long maturity assets, which is exactly those stylized facts that I showed you uh, at the start. Um, if you take the difference between that total risk equation from the previous slide uh, and this permanent risk equation, you can arrive at sort of our transitory risk equation. And the key insight is that movements in purely transitory or short run risk are going to elicit movements in the slope of the convenience yield curve. Okay. Um, so now we're going to take uh, these sort of asset pricing equations. Daniel, do you probably have to speed up a little bit? But... Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm actually quite close to done, apologies. Um, so we're gonna take that to the data. We're gonna have data for the US relative to G7 economies for 20 years. And the key thing we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate our measures of relative risk as if the Albers and German bounds held. So total risk is gonna be simply the equity risk premium. Permanent risk is gonna be equity net term premium and, and so forth. Okay, so to test these relationships, we're gonna run panel VARs. Uh, with, in the first case, total risk, convenience yields, and, and, and um, exchange rate risk premia. And we're going to see that a rise in, uh, in, in U.S. risk is going to lead to a rise in the exchange rate risk premium, but the effect seems relatively muted for the convenience yield. And the reason for this is it's masking offsetting effects. 
So what we see is that a rise in permanent risk leads to a fall in the convenience yield that investors derive from holding U.S. assets, whereas a rise in transitory risk leads to actually a rise in this convenience yield. So this is sort of a safe haven effect. Even when U.S. risk is relatively high, investors still clamor to hold U.S. dollar assets. The opposite is true uh, uh, for permanent risk movements. I'll just skip this. And basically, the key inside of our paper is that while things seem to be going relatively smooth uh, at short horizons, there seems to be cracks developing in, in, in the U.S.'s safe haven status at long maturities, as evidenced by its rise in, 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 in long run risk, as well as the fall in this uh, uh, pecuniary, non-pecuniary return to holding dollar assets. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we, Petro has a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Daniel. Can you hear us? Yes. Thank yeah. you. So thank you so much. So I have a couple of uh, questions about the paper. So the first one, if you could just give us some more detail about exactly why the risk of the U.S. has been increasing. Is this linked to well, macro factors or political uncertainty? And uh, furthermore, how should we think between absolute and relative uh, risk, right? I think everyone here will agree that probably things in the U.S. Has got, have gotten a little bit crazier in the past five or 10 years, but the rest of the world has been gotten crazier as well. So how should we compare absolute and relative uh, risks? And how do these results compare to all that uh, literature that we had before the global fin financial crisis that would talk about the great moderation and things like that? I know that that was more related to the equity risk premium rather than foreign exchange. But if you had something on that, I would love to hear your opinion. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, those are indeed very interesting questions. So um, first, why is the U.S. getting riskier? Um, so our, our setup is purposely remaining agnostic at this stage as to why the U.S. is getting riskier. But actually, that question is sort of where this paper is headed. So um, my like personal perspective is this might very well be related to quantitative easing. Uh, so why is why would quantitative easing be sort of a, a sign of U.S. risk or, or, or driving U.S. risk? So obviously it's raising equity premia, uh, but why is that why, why is that actually a sign of risk? So there's a potentially many reasons for that. Uh, on the one hand, you know, quantitative easing might eventually have to turn into quantitative tightening at some stage, and that unwinding uh, is is would lead to sort of a fall in, in in asset prices that would make investors less likely to want to hold U.S. assets uh, in, or command a greater premium to hold U.S. assets today. So that might be driving uh, uh, the U.S. risk. In particular, uh, if you look at which countries the convenience yield has fallen for most, uh, those are countries like Australia and Canada, countries where Obviously, they did not do much quantitative easing uh, relative to the U.S., so um, that's where this paper is going. Uh, and in our VARs, we plan to sort of, rather than looking at these um, these these just straight shocks to relative risk measures, rather we would put in measures uh, uh, of monetary policy shocks, maybe QE shocks, and see how those then transmit to relative risk, and then into exchange rates and and bond markets. Your question about uh, absolute versus relative risk is an in, is an interesting one. So the issue in our framework is that exchange rates are by definition a, a measure of relative risk um, because it's one currency in value in another. Um, so our framework actually isn't able to to answer something about um, sort of relative risk, sort of absolute risk. But that being said, investors are always going to need uh, to put their money someplace. So I, in my view, relative risk is what is uh, uh, of most importance um, in this case. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of great moderation, um, I, 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 I certainly think this sort of, you know, low for long uh, environment that even pre preceded the, 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 the GFC um, likely contributed to the rise in, uh, in, in, in US risk. Um, and so um, it's not necessarily something that developed just following the global financial crisis, but something that has been around probably since the early 2000s. Thank you. 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 Thank you